All right, here we go. Everybody wave. Wave to YouTube. Hi, YouTube. We are going to talk about something called Batch. And a few of you are like, what the hell is Batch? Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is what it is. Batch is the use of um, a job queue, we'll call it, to submit long-running, this is the key, long-running jobs to a system and then watch it and then take its output and do something with its output. Raise your hand if you can think or suggest some things that in 2024 lend themselves to this pattern. I don't think it's a surprise to tell anybody that machine learning, data modeling, crunching of data, creation of data model jobs, you know, putting a data, you know, creating data models that then can be used and integrated into things in 2024, I mean, it's all machine learning has has clearly, clearly dominated the IT industry across the board, and the batch pattern is the primary way to fulfill the needs of jobs that have to take a day, a week, two weeks, sometimes, and that are running on you know sometimes multi thousand dollar hardware uh, from Nvidia and stuff like that. So the, the concept of batch of submitting a job to a system goes way back to the 70s in the dawn of computing when we were doing mainframes. Now, I, I have a punch card. Um, you know, uh, my grandpa used, used to have jobs called computer operator, and they were the only people allowed to put the, the punch cards into the computer because, you know, touching the computer was like hands up. People were like, you know, arguing about keyboards in 2024 and... <laughs> Back then, you didn't even have access. To it. The point is that this pattern has been around forever. Why? Because the idea, even outside of computing, of having having a you know a system of some kind working on something and chugging away at it, and then producing output and being able to monitor that, that's been around forever. And you know whether whether you were smoothing stones for some reason, and you know, I mean, there's a million. Okay, so. It's, it's not so much that batch is an innovation so much as that the, the pattern meets the needs of machine learning teams, and that includes the enterprise. Um, so what does this have to do with cloud native? Um, and so I, I, the, this, the catalyst for this video is actually uh, this, this article that, I, that came across my, my desk. The Kubernetes turns 10, what's going to go on with cloud native? Um, Cloud native, Kubernetes is a cloud native architecture. Here's kind of the crux of it. Kubernetes and the whole cloud native ethos feels a little bit tired. Um, somebody inside of our, of our community said, Kubernetes has just passed through the Gartner hype cycle, which I will let you Google. But basically it's that as technology becomes popular, it goes way up. Everybody's using it. They're all hyping it up. And then it kind of falls into the trough of disillusionment. I mean, Gardner probably is making millions of dollars right now just by, you know, people saying this. And then people kind of, you know, the reality, it kind of comes out of the reality, you know. And and people kind of get to the, you know, this is what it's really good at if it, if it survives, right? Sometimes things fall off the, the thing and they never come back, like such as virtual worlds, for example, just to throw something out there. Um, and which is interesting because now, anyway, I could go down that path. I'm not going to. Kubernetes did what? What does Kubernetes do? Kubernetes is came about because of the whole problem with services. What is a service? A lot of you might already know this, but I, I'm going to, you know, if you're an absolute novice and you don't know what it is, a service in the IT sense is many things, but primarily in the IT, you know, department sense, a service is a web server usually that's running that's answering responses so it's a request response kind of situation sometimes it'll keep open the channel but ultimately it's a request response kind of thing that's why you have a server involved you have clients that are requesting it and they're saying i want a thing do this thing for me and while it is true that you can use a services architecture like that to you know, I want to request starting a job and then have something on the back end do its thing and then keep checking in on it, which is actually the API that we wrote for our batch system, which I'll get to. Then, you know, you, you, but most of the time when you're talking about a service, you're talking about a query, what's the weather like? What's the GPS of that plane? What's, you know, that's the kind of thing. And 
um, some of you may not know that you know, Amazon sort of championed the idea of the microservice. Um, Bezos is given credit for that, even though it was a concept that predates him by several years. Um, but the, the idea of saying, okay, everything in our enterprise is going to be one of these going to, going to be, a, there's going to be ultimately there's going to be a web server in there answering requests. Right. And since that time, you know, services have taken many different forms and not even necessarily HTTP, which is the web. Sometimes they also use, um, you know, gRPC, which is a reference kind of a, to a, an older thing called RPC. I mean, I've been around long enough to see this idea of, of services and distributed applications, uh, which is the broader term, um, you know, have many different forms. And, and, and the reason I say this is because there is this, you know, as as the 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 IT world went crazy breaking everything up into microservices, they all suddenly realized, oh damn, we broken we broken up everything so much, we have no way to you know centrally manage it. So you started getting these concepts called meshes that are organizing all of the services, and you know about that, you know in in that time frame, that's when Kubernetes came about, which used to be called Borg. If some of you don't know this, Kubernetes used to be called Borg. It was it was Google's own internal thing for managing microservices within Google, uh, which Google ultimately and very slowly decided to release to the, to the world. And we got to read all of their horrible, uh, very, very early go code that looks like a bunch of Java thrown together by people who have no idea how to write any go code. The Kubernetes code base is abysmally bad. Do not use it as an example of how to write go code. Uh, whether or not that's because they did it so long ago or not, I don't, that's a different question. I won't, I won't beat them up over that. But the, the point is, is the Kubernetes is the, is the, you know, the, the, the primary thing. Um, and as an engineer four years ago, when I got hired to do Kubernetes infrastructure engineering for a machine learning group, Kubernetes was all the rage. Um, in fact, I was specifically tasked with, um, looking at things like implementing Jupyter notebooks inside of Kubernetes and going through Jupyter hub and all these different things to facilitate our machine learning people. And, um, to tell you the truth, um, I mean, at one point we were trying to shoehorn these big, big batch jobs um, into Kubernetes. We were going to use Kubernetes as the replacement for our, you know, very old uh, batch processing system, which was implemented in a technology called PBS uh, that was originally implemented by NASA. A lot of people don't even know about this. Everybody's heard about Kubernetes. Nobody has heard about open pbs and, and i am going to tell you about it i'm trying to find it here um let me see if i can find it so let's find open pbs open pbs um there we go so this why is open pbs even something that i'm going to talk about this is not kids channel no no um so this is open pbs has transferred hands a few times um and the industry leading workload manager on job scheduler for high performance computing. So what is high performance computing? HPC it's called that that is high performance computing is at the core of machine learning because high performance computing is what is enabling the machine learning models to finish in faster times, which equals more money for the enterprise, et cetera. So, so HPC high performance computing is really, really key uh, to ML. In fact, in my organization, the organization is literally called HPC ML because they're associated so closely with one another and they will be for the foreseeable future with the goal of getting those models. And by the way, I wish I could talk to you, please don't tell where I work, but the, the, the rather boring company that I work for is doing things with their models, with their machine learning models that would blow your mind. One of the days, one of these days I'm going to be able to talk about what they're doing. Um, but, but using, using, you know, visual integration and other things, they can control systems, uh, consumer systems that you would know immediately. Um, and have them do things that you you cannot even possibly imagine. If you haven't been following what's possible within in the consumer realm uh, with high performance computing and machine learning, then you know you you, you want to look into it, it's particularly if you're looking at a, a job in tech. So and and you know again, full disclosure, I do in, you know infrastructure engineering. I spend a lot of time coding Go, and the what we're doing is we're enabling submission 
and our applications live in Kubernetes as a microservice in order to provide the web front eye front end and the UI and the rest API endpoints using Apigee, all of these things, you know, served up with Jin, they're all coming from our developers. Our developers are sending these rather large, very important machine learning jobs to these, you know, extremely expensive, um, it ultimately is extremely expensive GPUs, which are associated with these compute nodes, which are, which by the way, a node, if you've been, if you come from the Kubernetes world, a node has never just been about Kubernetes. A node is a, a machine in this case that is dedicated to doing a particular thing um, as a primary responsibility and you can bring them up and down and you can cluster them together. And this is exactly how Kubernetes manages microservices uh, by, you know, clustering nodes and stuff. But the concept of a node goes far, far back, you know, more back than, than just Kubernetes. And so you have these very, very large um, systems that are designed to run jobs for a very long time and to report on those things. And so systems like open PBS are there to help do those things. And the main takeaway from this video is to tell you that while you might think Kubernetes is the thing to learn to get the job today, and it probably is if you're going to go into infrastructure engineering, especially if you're supporting, there's a good chance that the applications themselves are going to be deployed to Kubernetes or something like it um, because it just handles, you know, the what happens if I have I need three or four web servers at the same time. That's what microservices and, and Kubernetes are good. They're good for doing. But, but something like PBS is designed to actually do the grunt work. And so I just want to make sure that you don't leave processing and understanding batch systems such as OpenPBS from your educational path if you're going to go into enterprise IT. Because chances are that you haven't heard about it yet and that you are also going to hear a lot about machine learning jobs and how to submit them and process them. And there are many, many um, solutions out there. I'm not going to name some of them that we've had horrible experience with, but there are lots of solutions that are more and more, they're catering and cloud solutions that are catering to this. And there is kind of a side quest here, and that is, how do you deal with the amount of CPU that's required to process some of these jobs? Um, we have had people within our organization um, think that they wanted to go to the cloud, and I won't I won't point out what cloud, but they went with the cloud, and then they tried to do some of these crunching these job crunching on these data model jobs, and they paid through the nose for the money there. And so, you know, renting renting a GPU from NVIDIA for $2,000 a month is nothing <laughs> compared to the costs that some of these people are paying through the cloud. So, you know, the rush to the cloud makes sense when it comes to things like, you know, Git operations and inner source and, and ex, you know, expanding, you know, the the CI CD offerings of services and the building of and release of software. It's still a very important part of the IT enterprise and it always will be. But, and when it comes to cloud, cloud is not going to be the solution for handling batch processing. I predict that if it hasn't already become a reality for most companies out there, that this batch processing that's being driven by machine learning, which is taking over every aspect of IT is going to continue to to push the need for on-prem affordable solutions for batch processing and the organizations that are that are seeing this they're the ones that are winning they're the ones that are that are that are you know and it, it's it's interesting because it's bringing a lot of the same factors are at play that that promoted the use of the mainframe and i i'm an old timer i never was really a mainframe guy but i'm extremely fascinated by the possibility of returning to more mainframe processing. And as the mainframes, they won't look like the mainframes of the past. They'll look more like clusters of nodes that they can be sliced up. But the but people on the mainframe have been slicing up virtual machines. I mean, the mainframe invented logical volume manager. The, the mainframe has been slicing up massive amounts of compute power into little, you know, chunks, nodes, Linux machines, whatever you want. They've been doing that since the seventies. 
I mean, they, yeah, or late eighties anyway. So, you know, they, they, they know how to do this stuff. Meanwhile, we have companies coming onto the scene like Oxide who are, you know, doing essentially the same thing with physical hardware and they're selling, they're selling you, you know, a, a cluster uh, of actual nodes, you know, and, and we're starting to see this, but there, at some point, a hardware vendor like IBM or any one of the mainframe vendors is going to be like, you know what? It's actually more efficient for us to send you, sell you one big piece of computing power and then let you divide it up the way you want to. I mean, it's going to be interesting. And why is this video even here? Because I am you know, fond of making videos that, that attempt to predict the future in a way that can help you, you know, know what to know what to learn. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, make sure you include batch processing and the idea of what it takes to do batch processing, um, which includes understanding uh, technologies, boring technologies that no one's talking about, like open PBS and, you know, Linux as well, because that's almost all of it's going to be on Linux. That's all.